Hey guys, it's Big Mike, and like always, I'd like to thank you for being here today. Today we have a webinar from Top Step Trader. Actually, webinar is only partially correct. It's also kind of a Ask Me Anything session, an extended session. Uh, what we're going to do today is have Michael Patak, uh, Bob, and uh, Mike from Top Step ask que or answer questions that you guys ask in kind of a roundtable fashion. Uh, John was also originally scheduled to be here, but had a really bad stomach flu and just couldn't hang in there, so we'll have to catch him next time. So uh, what we're going to do is there's a few slides that uh, will kind of facilitate some of the questions, um, get us talking about topics like fundamentals, uh, risk management, um, some of the hard work that you have to do as a trader, uh, risk and reward, that kind of stuff. And then what we'll do is just immediately open the floor to all of you guys to ask questions. Just type those questions into the questions panel. And uh, they'll pop up, and Bob is going to field all those questions from you guys and uh, present them to the panel, and we'll get uh, some answers for you guys and some discussions on some of the questions that you have. Uh, I do want to remind everybody the webinar is being recorded. I'll post the recording on VMT sometime tomorrow. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Bob. Give me one second, guys. All right. Bob, you should have control so that you can uh, show your screen. And let's see. Uh, Michael Patak, I'm going to turn your mic on. And it looks like we lost Mike Arnold. Um, I guess he's probably signing back in. We did, Mike. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, Mike just Skyped me that he had a, uh, he got a blue screen, so he's just doing a hard reboot and logging back in. Okay. So if you want to keep an eye out for him yeah. when he comes back in. Yeah, okay. So he should be in here in a minute. Okay. And Michael, are you there? I am here. Hey, how's it going, man? Pretty good. How are you guys doing? Good. Sorry John couldn't make it today, but uh, I got... Some bad allergies myself, so I, I know the feeling. I'm struggling over here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, it's a lot of people are coming down with it. John just uh, just caught it this morning, so uh, he, he spent half a day here. So Okay. Yeah. I see. I see how it is. So he wants to leave right before the webinar. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, so, uh, Bob, whenever, whenever I see Mike Arnold join, I'll just turn his mic on, okay? Um, but if you want, yeah, you can go that ahead. that sounds... That sounds perfect. So uh, just a quick comment, guys. Again, this is going to be a four-person panel. It's going to be a three-person panel. Right now, it's a two-person panel. So I'll take this opportunity to just uh, mention a couple of things. I'm going to go through only about, what was this going to be, about 17, 16 slides. I'll go through them pretty quickly. Uh, just to kind of set up what we want to talk about, um, I'll introduce the guys. And we'd like the majority of this to be back and forth. So if you could be patient. With some of the questions, um, we'll get to those. And you know, the way this GoToWebinar questions box works, they flow pretty quickly. So um, as I read them and sort of throw them out to the guys, they're going to go, they're going to scroll past my view, so I'll have to scroll back. So uh, bear yeah. with me if I don't get to your questions. Mike Arnold is back, by the way. Perfect. Can you hear us OK, Mike Arnold? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you great. So we are all set. Uh, Perfect. All right, again, guys, thanks for um, to Big Mike for having us. Uh, Mike Patak, Mike Arnold, thanks for taking time out of your schedule. Hope John Hogan feels better, and thanks to all of you for joining us. Again, we do a lot of webinars. We attend a lot of webinars, as I'm sure a lot of you do. And one of the things that we've talked about at Top Step Trader quite a bit is that it's our sort of job and our passion and, and our call to duty to develop traders, to help develop traders. And when we were talking about subjects for this, this particular panel, we thought it would be a pretty cool thing since essentially most traders overcomplicate things when they're at the novice stage. And I'm pretty sure the vast majority of you have traded for a decent amount of time and I'm guessing you're here to try and either improve your knowledge or get to where you've been trying to go. And we were talking in the office one day, and we realized that this is not 
you know, massive discovery that should be reported to NOVA or anything, but there's a lot of comparisons to training in athletics, and those comparisons are made all the time. So we thought we'd do a panel on understanding the training game and look at recreational versus professional traders sort of in relation to recreational athletes or weekend warriors versus the professionals. We thought there were a lot of pretty cool and pretty simple to understand correlations. So I start a lot of these webinars with uh, one of my favorite quotes, without ambition one starts nothing, without work one finishes nothing. The prize will not be sent to you, you have to win it. Um, that's going to apply throughout this particular panel. So again, bear with me a second. I have to read these. I was raised this way. Um, this presentation is for information purposes only and does not constitute investment advice nor an offer, solicitation or recommendation to acquire or dispose of any investment or to engage in any other transaction. This presentation is not intended for solicitation purposes, but only for use as general information. All descriptions, examples, and calculations contained in this publication are for illustrative purposes only. The risk of loss in trading the foreign exchange futures and equity markets can be substantial. You should therefore carefully consider whether such trading is suitable for you in light of your financial condition. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Before I get to all of these, this is my bio. I don't care about it. I cannot stand to look at my own bio or read it. As Big Mike said, he's kindly going to record this. So if you don't know who I am and you want to read who I am, I've been doing this about 22 years and you can read the rest on the recording. I just, I can't read about myself. Mike Pataka, on the other hand, I can read about. Other than a, uh, an illustrative career as a runway model, <laughs> kid's about 6'3", what do you want me to say? Top Step Trader founder and CEO Michael Patak has been an entrepreneur from early on, buying and selling cows at age 14, spearheaded a landscaping venture at 16, went on to start a juice importing company while studying at Iowa State University. Yep, he's one of those guys. Taking his earnings in the market and losing three separate $30,000 trading accounts, that experience was crucial to his creation of the Combine at Top Step Trader. The Combine has been created by Mike Patak. Top Step Trader was created by Mike Patak. Because he realized that going into the market without being prepared or disciplined could turn into a huge financial loss. After graduating, Michael began working as a proprietary trader at the Chicago Board of Trade. He owned his skills, learned to have loss limits, and eight months later, he was successful enough to buy himself a seat on the CBOT floor and start trading his own capital again. Michael launched the Top Trading Partners and Top Step Trader in 2010. He focuses on recruiting and scouting, training talent from around the world. Top Step Trader gives individuals the education and developmental tools necessary to prove they are consistent, profitable, and disciplined traders. Those successful in the combine are financially backed by Patak Trading Partners with a fully funded account. Michael, thanks for being here again. Thanks. Whoops. John Hoagland is ill. Won't be joining us. You can read about that in the recording, too. Who is Mike Arnold? Mike began trading in 1992 after graduating from Northwestern University with a degree in electrical engineering. After graduating, he went down to the trading floor at the Chicago Board Options Exchange and received an internship where he learned how to be an options market maker. He traded as a market maker in Chicago and in Europe. Since leaving the trading floors, he has worked as a consultant and helped to develop multiple trading strategies for both pairs trading firms and hedge funds. Mike has also been a partner in a statistical arbitrage and pairs trading firm, in addition to leading the development teams for multiple trading applications. He also served as the chief technology officer for two different firms. Mike actively trades the S&P, NASDAQ, and crude futures as well as a variety of cash forex currency pairs and individual stocks. Mike has been involved in teaching and training traders since 1995. Besides his trading background, he also has certifications in advanced hypnotherapy, is a master practitioner of neuro-linguistic programming and design human engineering. Mike has also extensively studied the field, of the field of behavioral economics and finance as it relates to trading. He currently serves as the chief strategy officer and the president of Top Step Trader University's College of Trader Development. Um, Mike not only looks very much like Dr. Spock, he is very much like Dr. Spock. <laughs> um, Mike, thanks for being here again as always. All right. I have, again, there's Johnny Hoagland. You guys in Big Mike's forum know a lot about Johnny. Johnny's one of the sweetest guys, one of the smartest guys out there. Just a ton of experience, comes from a 
a family of traders. You guys can read about this in the recording as well. So there is a popular trading statistic out there that 90% of traders fail. And we feel it's because most people don't realize or understand the difference between being a recreational trader and a professional trader. Now, we talked about this up in the office the other day, and we agreed that there's nothing wrong with being a recreational trader if that's what you want to be. Um, the vast majority of you put a lot of time into this. We just think that the direction is wrong. And again, you can see these weekend warriors on the left-hand side. Nothing wrong with it. But each one of them is a quarterback, is a running back, is a defensive back, is a defensive end. Whereas the field on the right, sorry, use the Chicago Bears if any of you are from Green Bay. The field on the right is what houses the professionals where everybody has a role. Now, uh, Mike Batak, we you had a pretty cool example of, of what we mean by this. Do you, do you mind going into that before I move on? Well, as far as uh, the, the example uh, that we want to talk about with the Bears, is that what you're talking about, Bobby? Yeah, the Bears example, the professional versus recreational in terms of them having roles. Yeah, well, we, we, we talk about uh, uh, this a lot. Bobby, you and I talk about this a lot. We talk about it with Mike Arnold, the scout team, everybody we work with. And it's basically just defining who you are and what is your role. Uh, we all want to make that money. You know, the big paying money, we all want to make that Adrian Peterson money, the LeBron James money, the, the professional money. But the thing about it is, is knowing where you are at in that journey to make that money. Uh, you know, we were talking about Patrick Manley, the Bears' long snapper. You know, the Bears just won last night. Go Bears! Uh, he's making over a million dollars a year just being a long snapper. He's the ultimate specialist he's, because he's very good at doing one thing and one thing very well. He's been doing that for 16 years. Uh, the average, you know, uh, the minimum, I guess, salary for the 2012 season would be like a rookie. I think is 390k up to uh, if you've been in the league 10 plus year, the minimum salary is 900,000. So my point basically is saying, is saying is Patrick Manley specializes in one thing. Not everyone can be a Peyton Manning. Not everybody can be an Adrian Peterson. Not everybody can be a LeBron James. But, but if you work hard and learn one thing very, very well, you can do awfully well in whatever that is that, that your, your, your chosen profession is. So that's something that I want to get right off the bat at is we, we at uh, Tops of Trader, we and the traders that I, I'm around, there's nothing wrong with recreational traders. There's nothing wrong with professional traders. But what's wrong is not knowing which one and where you are and and where you want to go and uh, and how to get there. And that that's something that you know we we try to open the eyes and grab a you know grab a little transparency and say hey you know this is who you really are as a trader. You know, and it's a question that, that's a, that's a great example, and it's a question of what a recreational trader is. Okay, I know a guy, and, and actually, oddly enough, Michael Patak's father and this guy that I know are friends. He sold a company for multiple million dollars. He's a recreational trader. Every once in a while, he sees a trade. He puts it on. He really doesn't care if he wins or loses. He risks about $10,000. That's a recreational trader. Nothing wrong with it. Nothing wrong with what he does. It's not how he makes his living. It's a little bit of fun for him. Very much like walking past a roulette table and just putting... 10 grand on red. That's what he does. That's what a recreational trader is. Recreational traders think that you learn a strategy and advance on to money, but the vast majority of them experience something more like this, leading them to be part of that 90% we're talking about. A lot of you guys have heard me do a webinar before on why traders fail. I don't particularly consider all of those people that fall into that 90% as actual traders. They're just people that put on a trade, but yet they fall into that sort of statistic. So there's realities in the trading game that are either not known or not grasped by the novice trader. The comparison to sports and trading are not only endless, but they can be very, very accurate. And the comparison that's not often made, and it's what we want to talk about here and what we want to just have a back and forth with you guys about, is the recreational athlete to the recreational trader and the professional athlete to the professional trader. You can actually choose to be one or the other. Okay? We're going to focus on five main trading game realities for this panel discussion. <clears throat> Mastering the fundamentals, understanding risk management as your defense, showcasing hard work and analysis for game time success for correct decisions at the time of the trade, consistency of risk and reward over showboating, and actually knowing your role in the trading game. So mastering the fundamentals. So Mike Arnold, right? 
What I want to ask you about this particular thing is, this is a, Mike Patak mentioned LeBron James. This is a LeBron James basketball camp, right? These guys are practicing left-handed dribble, okay? These guys are practicing left-handed dribbling in a LeBron James basketball camp. Does anyone get the irony there? This is the flashiest guy in the league, right? And they're practicing left-handed dribbling. Mike Arnold, you did a lot of the work in creating the basics of our college as well as the advanced stuff. What's your sort of thoughts on, on fundamentals versus what many people think they should be learning? Well, again, if you're going to excel in anything like in basketball or any other sport, it's not just about learning to dunk the ball. You know, that's it's what a lot of street ball players who would be the rec recreational guys, you know, they work on their flashy dunks and all these trick shots you, that, that they're, they're very showy and, and look very impressive. But they don't have the fundamentals down to actually be able to take it to a professional level and play in the league. They don't work on these the boring things. They don't master the basics, which is what you have to constantly fall back on as a professional athlete and as a professional trader. We're treating this as a business, and that's what we're trying to get through to a lot of people that trading, especially at the professional level, is a business. And what you said earlier, Bob, it's not just about learning a strategy. Just as becoming a professional basketball player is not about learning how to dunk. It's learning how to left-handed dribble, how to cross over dribble, how to do the layup, how to set a pick. Okay? And so that's that's really how I see it, is mastering the fundamentals, mastering the boring things, mastering, and there's aspects of trading that a lot of people would be considering boring, understanding the different chart types and the nuances of it, understanding the basic concepts. It's not just about getting a flashy new indicator and, oh, when it crosses this line, I buy, and when it crosses this line, I sell. That's not mastering the fundamentals mm -hmm. of trading. That's not building up your knowledge from a ground floor into a consistent, repeatable methodology and structure to establish your trading business. It's interesting. Marcin J. just commented that he really likes to compare boxing to other fighting sports. That's kind of interesting because if you look at this very next slide, I think the fighting sports, um, full disclosure, I boxed for eight years. And one of the things I say over and over and over again to people who are interested in trading is that you can't get into the ring and not get hit. It's just never going to happen. You can't expect to win a fight without getting hit. You can see in this image, the guy on the ground isn't necessarily going to lose the fight. He's losing right now. Right? That's Mike Patak on the top and me on the bottom. But he's definitely <laughs> losing right now. Right? But what you're seeing, the, the sort of analogy here is this guy, at least in this still image, is not jumping up and trying to flip it right away. I mean, Mike Patak, in relation to losses, I mean, what does this make you think of? This makes me, in relation to losses, this makes me think of protecting uh, myself as much as I can so that I keep myself alive. It's funny because these are real simple images, right? And a lot of the times people attend webinars and they, we get questions all the time. First question ever when we do a webinar or a panel, how do I get into a good S&P mini trade? Not even close to the first question that should come up for most traders. Not even close. That's like the guys in the fighting sports, like you said, Manson, coming in and saying, okay, show me how to throw a Superman punch with a spinning back kick so I can knock this guy out and not leave myself in a situation like is pictured right here. And it just doesn't happen. So when you get to sort of these levels of fundamentals, your risk management is your defense. Okay, it really is. Now, I'm just going to touch on something real quick before I go on to the next slide. And again, I really want to open this stuff up for questions and comments. So I'm glad some of you are starting to put comments in there. When you have a situation where your defense is poor, you're going to get knocked out at some point. And there are fighters that survive that way but not that long. They either are flashes or they, they never quite make it to the top, okay, because they take too much punishment, way too much punishment. They end up either permanently hurt, permanently damaged, or they just never make it to where they want to go. So 
everybody talks about strategy and psychology. When you get to yourself to the point where you understand that you have to get better at these basics we're covering, psychology almost becomes a natural thing that improves. Hard work and analysis for game time success. So how many of you play golf out there? Actually, you don't have to, men you don't have to comment because there's too many of you. But if you play golf at any serious level or if you've ever watched anyone, any of the pro golfers, they will hit 500 to 1,000 balls a day. A day. Okay? For that one shot. In order to get themselves in the position where they know what they will do when the time comes. I'm 200 yards out. Can I get to the green with a three-way? Probably. Should I? Probably not. Depends on the situation. Are there sand traps in the way? Is there a, watering, uh, a water hole in the way? Uh, a water hazard, rather. Mike, you talked about this with, with the short game, or Mike Arnold. What, is that, what does that tell you? Yeah, well, I used to go on uh, one of my side jobs. I used to go around and coach uh, professional golfers, especially on uh, strategy and course management, and I was out there all the time working with them and practicing with them. And literally out of those, let's say they hit the thousand balls and put themselves in different situations on the course management, 70 to 80 percent of it was based on the short game. That's where they lost. They focused on the details and what was going to help them the most or could potentially hurt them the most when playing the game. They didn't just focus on standing on the tee and trying to drive the ball 350 yards or 330 yards. They practiced the least, the club they practiced the least with was their driver. And the clubs they practiced their most with were generally seven irons and lower, like seven iron, nine iron, the different wedges, and especially the putters, and, and their short game, especially getting out of sand traps, getting out of sp spots, getting out of rough. They just didn't drop the balls in the middle of fairways in practice. They also practiced all their short game shots in, in, in and around the rough because they had to know how they were going to handle the shot when it, when it came up in the heat of a golf tournament. And they had to know how, what club they were going to use and what stance they were going to use and how open or closed they were going to hold the face of the club. And again, it was practicing the fundamentals, practicing the boring stuff, doing the hard work over and over again you know, it's, it's fun to stand out there, out there at the driving range or at the, the tee box, you know, and pull out you, your driver and see how far you can hit it. That's fun. It's not real fun to practice the same chip shot a hundred times in a row or getting out of different the, uh, sand trap 50 times in a row. But that's what got them the strokes on the court. That's what saved them the strokes when they were on the course and they knew what they could rely on, and it's essentially the same thing a trader does with the hard work and analysis. The putting on the trade's the easy part. The analysis the, is the boring part. It's hitting that iron over and over again, waiting for the time that the proper setup's there, and then you have your go-to shot. It's the decision-making, right? It, this kind of that F -E -S -X, F-E-S-X, put up a comment that I really want to want to touch on. And by the way, for all of you throwing in those ninja trader questions, I'll give uh, Mike Patak a few minutes toward the end to address that. So stick around because uh, he'll he'll address that. We got that ninja trader question a couple of times, but F E S X Urex says game is not a level playing field. How do you compete with high frequency traders who are muddling the dom, do a lot of volume and spam the market with their orders and always know where the market is heading? couple of quick things and then I'll let you two guys comment on this if you want. We are not competing with high frequency traders. In other words, you don't see Derrick Rose on the Chicago Bulls, who's six foot tall, in the slam dunk competition. But he's still in the same game. He's still in the NBA. Okay, you got guys, I, I knew a guy named uh, Travis Diener. He played at Marquette and he played with the Indiana Pacers. Okay, he was their 10th man basically. He never got in, but he was a practice player. He was a really good practice point guard, and by the time he stopped playing six years later, he was making the league minimum in the NBA, which was three million bucks. And now he's got a three-year contract to play in Italy. You don't have to compete with the high-frequency traders, and that's one of the myths. Okay, you don't have to go out there and think 
very much like golf, which a lot of you are commenting that golf is the closest analogy to sports. Great analogy, or I'm sorry, trading. Great analogy, golf and trading. <clears throat> That's all perfect because in golf, you're not playing against the other golfer. You're playing against the course. So FESX, your X, you want to play against your own game. Okay? You want to play against your own strategy. Master your own strategy. Don't worry what the high frequency traders are doing. You can't stop them. You can't control them. And this is exactly what I mean about choosing to be a professional over being an amateur. They have nothing to do with you. We all Bob, play on the same playing field. Go ahead, Mike Patel. Yeah, so I want to throw it in there quickly. Uh, somebody told me to re read Zen Golf and just change the word from golf uh, to trading. Uh, Dr. Andrew Menneker, a great trading psychologist, told, told me that one when I first met him. So uh, anybody want to take me up on that, read that book. It's, it's a great, every time you see golf, change it to trader. Next, with the high frequency and how do you compete and all that, Guys, when I first got in the business, and, and I started in uh, 97, but I didn't come to the pits until like 02. Uh, before that, what, I, I remember people would, uh, the people I knew because I was clerking for a, a trader in the pits, they would say, well, how do you trade when the big money just comes in here and bullies the market and pushes it around? There's always a way to play the game, and there's people that play it at all different levels. You got your Soros level, you got your Paul Tudor Jones level, you got your I just got five thousand dollars and I'm going to put it in the the uh, trading account level, and you got all these people in between, and th there's a there's a way to play the game, and and it's finding out how you play the game. Uh, you know, you're not playing others, you're playing the course kind of deal. Uh, that's that's kind of the first step is understanding there are people that are doing well. Now the ninety yeah. percent, we talk about the ninety percent a lot. We use that uh, 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 <clears throat> percentage quite a bit. You know, there's a lot of people that fail. So of course, you do not want to be the majority. You want to be the minority, the ten percent that succeed, and the, the less percentage than that 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 takes that don't take, but they 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 make majority of the money. You can go with any profession and see the exact same thing from your A rods, your Jeters, your Jordans, your Lebrons. You know, your small percentile. And then you've got these other players that are in the league still, still making their money, still able to do this. What what level do you want to play the game at is kind of what you need to understand your talent uh, can 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 get to. Because talent super, supersedes everything, uh, whether you're creating an algo uh, or whether you're, you're trading discretionary just on your own. You know, you have to be talented in all ways and be a professional in all ways to consistently hone and work and, and tweak yourself every single day. It's not just, okay, here it is, now let's just go out and I, I perfected my game. It's consistently working on your game and, and staying ahead of others. Uh, so there are, there are ways to do this, and that's why we're trying to uh, unravel all these layers that people have of, of trading uh, and, and these negative vibes about it and say, all right, there's basics to it, there's fundamentals to it, uh, let's get to that first and then build off of that. That's a great point. In trading more than, than any other business, Okay, it's it's only like sports in this way, and and you know if you look back to Mike Arnold's bio, he programmed strategies for hedge funds, and I know for a fact that not many of them were high frequency trading strategies, right? Pimco does not use high frequency trading; they make quite a bit of money. But back to the relationship with sports, if if you have an edge, okay, I don't know how anybody thinks they know what the high frequency traders are doing with any degree of certainty or how anyone thinks they know what the institutions are doing with any high degree of certainty. I don't have that ability. It doesn't mean that you don't have the ability, but I don't. But yet I still continue to trade because I found something that works for me and I'm mastering the fundamentals of it. Still to this day, I'm working on the fundamentals of it. But Mike, Arnold, when you worked with the hedge funds, how many of them said, hey, I gotta chase the high frequency traders around? You know, that was not even a, a top of a, co a conversation because either you were a group that was specializing in HFT and then your focus was what the other HFTs were doing, not to like, oh, they're picking me off or anything else because you were out competing with them because you're doing sub-second trading. Oh, but the funds I worked with, they, did, they could care less what, the, what any of those firms were doing. They were working on strategies based off their time frames that they were trading, their markets they were trading, and they were going for bigger targets with bigger stops and holding trades longer. Whether that meant they were holding trades for 30 minutes, which compared to an HFT, because I have done a small amount of consulting with HFT, most of those trades are closed out 
sub sub seconds. I mean, we're talking picoseconds the trades can last. And now you're talking, so somebody's trading even the 30 minute to an hour time frames. It, it's a whole different ball game. So Listen, if you guys want, Mike, I don't mean to interrupt you, but Rob Cree just threw something in that sort of applies to what you're saying. And when you guys have time, go go Google a guy named Rishi Naram. Okay, he's a good friend of mine out in California, and he's a high frequency trader, hedge fund owner, and he basically says, "You guys don't know what we're doing, nor will you ever know." So Rob Cree wrote, "Programmers design the H A T H F Ts, Mike Arnold, so they are still people design." Can you comment on what the high-frequency traders are designed to operate in the marketplace? He sort of already was, Rob, but I'll let you keep talking, Mike. Well, the HFT, I mean, true HFT is sub-second order flow uh, trading. You're, you're jumping in line on order flow. You're, I, I sort of call it picking off orders to immediately turn around and dump onto the, somebody you know standing in line behind you. It's like you're standing in line at a concert and you know you're going to get to the, the line ahead of the guy behind you, you're going to buy the tickets he wants, and then you can turn around and sell it to him. That's what the HFTs are focused on. I mean, so I wouldn't worry about it. It's, there's another thing. It's the, it's the mindset, and we've sort of touched on this a number of ways. It's the, it's the sort of professional versus you know, non-professional mindset. The, the professionals don't find things to blame it on. I mean, it's like if I'm taking a golf shot, yeah, somebody might shout in the crowd, but at the end of the day, and, you know, it might, if it disturbs me, it's my issue. It's not their issue. You know, it's still my shot. I either have reasons or results, and as a professional, I'm looking for results. And there's always something to blame. I mean, back to sports, there's been a number of, of players. Like, remember Doug Flutie, who originally started in the NFL, in, what, in the mid-'80s, played for the Bears? Then where'd he go to? Uh, the Patriots. But then he, he essentially made a lot of success in the Canadian Football League, winning Grey Cups and championships up there before he came back to the NFL again and had a lot of success. He was only a five foot ten quarterback. Look at the size of a lot of these uh, defensive players with their, with their wingspan arms. And he, he wasn't even taller than them. I mean, these guys are huge. And he had a lot of success when he came back. He just figured out what worked for him fine-tuned his game, didn't let, he didn't worry about, oh, these guys are bigger than me and I'm only a 5'10 quarterback. You know, he figured out how to make it work and then was successful in Canada, came back here and was successful again, finished up his career with the Patriots. I mean, there's always, there's reasons or results, and that's one of the things, professional mindset, there, you're going to come up with the results. You're not going to find reasons of why something is out to get you or why something's going to fail. You're going to find a way to make it work. Real quick, uh, Kelly's asking the name of that book again, Mike Pachuk. Was it Zen Golf? Uh, Zen Golf, yeah. Zen Golf and Trade. Just a short, it's, it's a short little read, too. I want to say it's uh, 100 pages of that small little book. Yeah, and Brian, you're right. Doug Flutie was 5'8". Real quick, let me just throw this one up there, and then we'll get started just with pure questions, because a lot of you may know who this is. This is Ted Williams, right? His nickname was the Sweet Swing. Ted Williams had the highest on-base percentage in baseball, okay, ever. Highest on-base percentage. He also had one of the best swings ever, one of the highest overall averages, but not the highest. One of the highest number of hits, but not the highest. Pretty far up there in home runs, but not the highest just consistently swing correctly and the best eye probably baseball ever see, ever has ever seen. If the ball was high and outside, he didn't swing at. Now could somebody with this skill set have probably slapped it down the line every once in a while? Yes. Wrong thing to do though, right? He knew the game of baseball. He swung correctly when it was his pitch. When it wasn't, he walked. For those of you that know what on base percentage is, Essentially, the amount of times you get on base, not counting drop third strikes or uh, hit batsmen, I think. I'm actually not sure about that. But his swing was so perfect, but yet he still didn't swing at balls. Somebody asked in here, can you give some examples of fundamentals we can practice and a way that we can practice the pressure of actual trading? 
all three guys, I'm including myself in that, and I'm including John Hoagland in Abstentia, will tell you that it's virtually impossible to simulate live money trading in demo. Okay? That stress is just different. However, you want to practice some stress, pass on a trade that is almost there, but just not good enough. Mm -hmm. If you really want to practice something that's hard to do, pass on a trade that is 99% of your setup, but not 100%. Write the steps to whatever your setups uh, are down, list them out, and if even one of those steps is a maybe, not just a no, okay, let's say you're looking for a particular moving average cross as part of your steps. Okay, if it looks like it's about to cross but didn't, pass on that trade, and then watch that trade go your way and feel that pressure. A lot of traders actually regret missed gains more than they regret losses. There's something a little bit messed up about that because one of the cliches that I always use, which is not that I always use, which is not that clever, is that there's only three possible outcomes to a trade: a win, a loss, and a break-even, and two of them are good. So, Ted Williams is the perfect example of learning consistency of risk and reward. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, consistency of risk is pretty easy, right? No flyers. Don't try to swing for the fences. Don't try to slap a ball that's high and outside because you want to be the guy to drive in the run as opposed to taking the walk. Don't try to do that stuff. Right? Be consistent. Do what you do. Okay? In terms of consistency of reward, this is something that is sort of a huge debate, in my opinion, out there as to whether the amount of money you make actually matters as long, as long as you control your losses, can you succeed? It's my stance that your entire trading has to be focused on your losses. How much can I risk? That's always been my stance. But it's not, you don't end there. Okay, your plan has to begin with how much can I risk? How do I survive the inevitable losing streak that was shown on that slide with the, with the MMA fighter, right? But in terms of reward, and I want to throw this out to Mike Batat, some of the guys that we see out there, it's not just greed that takes over, it's fear, it's every other emotion that you feel during a losing streak also takes place during winning streaks, bordering on cocky. Do you ever think somebody like Ted Williams, with all the accolades he got, ever changed a thing in his swings? I mean, Mike Batat, what do you see out there in terms of people that just, they just don't understand the reward side? Okay, basically, I guess I, I see the people that don't understand it, I, I see a lot of uh, shots in the dark, a lot of uh, high, high risk plays, um, uh, a lot of lack of discipline. I see an extreme lack of discipline and then throwing everything that you sort of started building up, you throw it all out the window and it stops working. Uh, that's kind of what I see the most, I think. And then, you know, I, I've always kind of push this and I was always told this as, as a trader when I first started and it was if you can't become a professional athlete become a trader and this is what the first thing my, my trading manager told me when I moved to Chicago and I, I, I truly believe that we're athletes of the marketplace that's why we bring to you uh, this MMA fighter this uh, golf golfing analogies the baseball analogies stuff like that because it, the uh, every professional every athlete that, that makes it to that level has the fundamentals they have the the, the risk management you know, if you're an MMA fighter and you're on your back, are you taking a high high risk play at that moment in time with your with yourself on the back, with you barely being able to defend yourself? Are you going to be open yourself up and take a high risk play? I don't think you would, because that's going to really really hurt. And and that's something that we need to focus on as traders is understanding. You know, when we have our back uh, against the wall and 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 we have a losing streak going, uh, are we getting more aggressive? Are we, are, or can we just shut it down and, and, and wait for the bell to save you, save, save, save yourself for the end of the day trade? Okay, I'm done. Or to give yourself your own bell and say, all right, I'm done today. Um, so, yeah, you know, it's just a combination of a lot of things, but I want people to, to take out of this, and, and I'm going to jump to kind of my little final thought, Bob, is, is you, we're athletes in the marketplace, and we need to consistently work on ourselves, just like the athletes out there do, whether in the batting cage, in the gym, uh, studying their opponent. Uh, reading, doing film, 
all that kind of stuff. You can be journaling. You can be recording. You can have a, a recorder over your shoulder watching your, your screen all there. You can screen record your, or, uh, your, your trading all day long and then go over that. Uh, you can have a trading partner just like a, another uh, workout partner. Uh, you can have, we are athletes of the, of the marketplace and you need to start thinking that way because it's your money on the line when you go out there and play. So it's your skin on the line when you're out there in a fight in the in the in the ring, and and it's all that hard work you put into it when you're up at deck and you get those you know three pitches. I think on average it's like three pitches a game of professional athletes to go out there and showcase their talent in front of thousands of people. You know you don't have this endless amount of option or opportunities to do that. Uh, just like the bullets that you have when you open up a trading account or or however you do it, you know you need to be smart. You need to look like a pre professional. You need to be very diligent, very patient, very disciplined, stay focused, and be and do everything at a high level when you're out there. This isn't a, a video game, uh, and we need to get over the video game period of trading, which I, I was at at one point early on in my career. And that's one of, one of the $30,000 trading accounts I lost was the video game period of my, my career. But getting past all that is when you really start developing, you really start kind of yielding the, the fruits of, of the, 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 the hard work that you put in this business, it may not come in millions of millions of dollars. I wasn't a million dollar a year trader. My best year was, was mid six figures. I knew I could average low six figures and I knew when I first started I just wanted to make at least a hundred dollars a day to even prove to myself and my family that you know I took this route, I had a college education and I need to be getting paid for it. So get on the, the, the baby steps of just breaking even after a month, then just focus on making a little bit of money after that, and then slowly working yourself up to a, a, a certain level. Uh, John Hoagland, I think, has said this before. You know, he stood next to millionaires, and he stood next to people that were completely broke in the pit. We, I did the exact same thing. I didn't care where they were at. Is my personal journey and and how far I wanted to to take myself down that journey, and how much effort and 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 motivation I had was all within me, and I had to dig deep every single day for it. You know, it's a great point, and that whole thing about standing next to millionaires and standing next to broke guys, I wish John was here to talk about that because, you know, a lot of you guys, again, you focus on these individual things. We've got another person in here saying, you know, what about when the high-frequency traders do this and that? You're not trading against them, okay? You're not. They are not the entire market. They're a large part of it. You are trading against the moves that the markets make. Somebody typed a question in here, how do we know for sure if it's a bottom or a top? Let me know when you figure that out. I'd love to hear it. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear anything that you can find out for sure. Remember the picture? Mike, you just kind of talked about this. Remember the picture of the uh, boxer or the MMA guy getting hit? I'd like to know how he can find out for sure when he can get into a fight and when and not get hit. Yeah. See, what actually ended up happening is we started out as scalpers and the institutions were longer term. And now we get into this area where the institutions have a lot of money in high frequency trading and I sort of backed off on my duration because I can't know for sure when the bid is the bottom or when the offer is the top. And there are things, even though this was a great, great, you know, there's great examples in sports, professional sports, let's forget recreational for a minute because you have to make that distinction as to whether you're going to be a recreational trader. A professional trader is not the same as another. One professional trader is not the same as another professional trader's. Okay, you are not competing with other traders, your ex. You're competing with the market, period. Okay, when you make money, someone else loses, for sure. But it doesn't have to be the high frequency guy. It can be the guys who haven't learned what you've learned. Okay, it can be those guys, <laughs> right? So you don't have to compete with the high frequency traders. They can do whatever they want. And you know, there again, even in professional sports, Mike Arnold had some great comments. I want to throw it, I want to throw the mic to him about there's things in professional sports that absolutely you won't ever do in trade. Do you want to go into that, Mike? Sure. I, I just wanted to touch on this because oh, there are a lot of great sports analogies that we've been putting out there, and everybody, and even a lot of people listening, they're like, "Yeah, golf's a good one," or boxing, or what, whatever the sport is, but there's there's certain things that we're not going to do as traders that happen in sports, and like we're not going to pull our goalie with uh, 
with like 30 seconds left trying to win the game. Why? Because we're not going to expose ourselves to losing at that. It's not applicable to trading. We're not going to take the half-court buzzer shots because there's no time limit to trading. We're not going to put just take this super risky shot because there's nothing to win. Okay? Those are the kinds, we're not going to throw up a Hail Mary pass, meaning we're not going to put on a flyer, which is directly attributable to trading. We're not going to, oh my gosh, my trading account's down. I got to make all my money back before the end of the day, which is arbitrary. So I'm going to take a huge position and essentially put on a flyer, put on a Hail Mary. Not applicable. Okay? Those are the things in sports we're going to leave behind as professionals because there are aspects of sports that do not directly apply to trading. So we're talking about the things that do. The hard work, the working on the fundamentals, the working on the consistency, knowing yourself, knowing your strategy, knowing what your behaviors are. And it's also knowing your strategy inside and out, knowing the steps of your strategy. Are they repeatable? Can you repeat them time and time again? Do you repeat them time and time again? when you are sitting in your trading chair or you define yourself deviating from those. Those are the analogies we're tying together with sports, not to, oh boy, let's see, it's uh, S&Ps are closing in, in 10 minutes and I'm down $5,000. I'm going to put on 50, 50 minis and see if I can make it in, going into the close because it looks like we're going to close strong. I'm just going to put on this big trade and I hope I'm going to make it all back. That's not what we're talking about. It's a great quote, by the way, Nick. Doubt kills more dreams than failure ever will. I like that. I'm going to combine a couple of things here because there's some things I haven't answered, and I'm going to go straight to these, these questions, but there's a couple that I can combine. For example, Mary says, I have an extensive sports background. I always try to practice pressure. Do you have any advice on how to practice trading pressure? And then there's one here, and this is part of the couple that I'm going to combine. What are the top three fundamentals, and what would it look like to add the process of trading and preparation? And that sort of fits as well with this other comment in here by Scott. And Scott, I'm going to read your whole comment because it kind of answers those two questions. So Scott wrote, Bobby, I had a trade this morning at around 9 a.m. Central Time, and I had so, so many confirmation on the ES reversal, and the risk reward was so ideal that when I executed the trade, I felt no emotion. Listen to that for a second, because one of the things that the three of us really want you all to focus on is your own process. Somebody typed in here, who was that? Um, you are also competing against yourselves, Charles. I would argue you're only competing against yourself. But let me finish Scott's comment. I felt no emotion at all. I had done my job and all the elements were in place that I did not care if I lost due to I knew I had followed my plan exactly. So it goes to doing my best, and I was satisfied with that. Notice that Scott did not write whether it was a winning trade or a losing trade. Did you guys notice that? Because Scott was focused on his process. You practice trading pressure by doing your best to eliminate trading pressure. There's two ways, in my opinion, and if either one of you want to comment on this, please jump in. In my opinion, there's two ways to eliminate trading pressure. Take risk you can afford to take. That's the first one. Okay, don't risk $500 if you've only got $550, right? Now, obviously, that's just an example, but, you know, there's people out there that have $10,000 trading accounts, and they've got a net worth of $10 million, and then there's people out there that have $10,000 trading accounts, and they've got a net worth of $11,000. Guess who feels more pressure if they're taking the same amount of risk? And the second way you practice trading pressure by eliminating trading pressure is by understanding that trading is about your process. Okay, now you see the second bullet point on the slide here is being a professional trader, and this goes to the question of what would be your advice for someone who asked me that question. Um, what's the best process route to take if I realize I am a recreational trader and I want to become a professional? That's TJ. Is being a professional trader about time spent trading or time spent analyzing? I'm talking too much, so I'm going to throw this to Mike Arnold and then a little bit to Mike Patak as well. But for me, it's about time spent analyzing. I hit my loss limit trading today. Today I hit my daily loss limit. I did not shut my machine down and go eat popcorn. 
I started researching a strategy that I'm looking at, or rather continued to research a strategy that I'm looking at. That's what I did with the time. Okay, I didn't stop working. I have hours of the day that I work. Okay, now, every day that I do my preparation, form up the trades that I'm going to take, okay, I prepare, and a vast majority of that preparation shows me trades I'm not going to take. So, to Mike Arnold and then Mike Patak, if you have any comments as well, is trading about taking trades or is it about analyzing the market, some of which might result in trades, others might not? I believe it's an analyzing the market, and that's where the focus should be. And something you touched on before with uh, removing stress is I have a step-by-step -step process. I actually have decision trees printed out that I can look for, especially when I've learned a new strategy. So I'll go through, and it will literally be step one, do this. Step two, do this. And I'll line up. There might be ten steps in it. And if at any one point a step I say no to, there is no trade. So that's part of my analysis. It's sitting at, okay, I have a potential setup in the S&P. Uh, it's a potential trend line long setup. All right. Is it going to close beyond the trend line? Is it going to close, you know, above this key level? What is my, what is my target? Is, what is, is my risk reward better than uh, one and a half to one, et cetera, et cetera. I go through each of my steps, and then I know if I get to the end of my steps, my analysis is done. And then it's real simple. There's a trade. I know how much I'm risking. I know that every step was in place, so it's a valid one of my trades, so I've done my analysis. And then the aspect of trading takes about uh, two seconds. You know, it's entering the order, entering the stop, and if it's a target trade or multiple target trade, it's then entering the targets. The aspect of trading is minuscule. The most of the time is analysis, step one. Are we going to get a close beyond this valid trend line? No, the market pulled back and closed just on the other side of the trend line. All right, no trade for me. Next market or next setup or next whatever. So it's constant analysis and doing it in a structured, methodical approach, not just coming up with rules on the fly, not just so, oh, well, normally I use these indicators, but now I, my buddy just told me to start watching this one, and that's in conflict with what I'm seeing, so should I take the trade to I not? No. What are your steps? If you're going to put a new indicator in, then you have to go back test. You have to go analyze. You have to go structure that all up into place. And then you come up with your refined set of steps. But you do that at other times. Like you spent today, Bob, uh, researching a, a new strategy or continued researching a strategy because you hit your loss limit. So you stopped trading. You followed your rule. And now you're analyzing a new potential setup, and I hope you're doing that, and I know you very well, so I, this, is a, this is a rhetorical question. I, I know you're analyzing this because you started analyzing this setup before, and it's not because you hit your loss limit. It has nothing to do with that, which is something we should just quickly delve into, that a professional trader also knows his stuff backwards, forwards, and does not abandon what he's doing just because he hit hey, he hit his maximum loss for today, or just because he had five losers in a row. It'd be like a, a golfer changing their swing because they just bogeyed three holes in a row, or a, a professional baseball player changing their batting stance and their whole routine just because they struck out for two straight, every, every at bat for two straight games. We that's part of our process and structure also, and that's also what linked into being a professional trader, knowing what our methodologies are, not abandoning them, and not going chasing the next shiny object just because we had a couple of losers in a row. Hey, Mike Patak, before you go on, I just had to read this to you because you'll laugh. Charles Chapman wrote, the ultimate goal, Zen-like, is to be equanimous about profits and losses <laughs> after the trade not just free of emotion, as the trade is put on paper. I'm sorry, Charles, it's just the you know, equanimous is kind of my word. Yeah. The, the thing about this, and I, and I know, Mike Patak, you deal with this every single day, is that it's not about, I said, eliminate the emotion. Okay? Mike Arnold always says, um, recognize your emotion, control your action. And Mike Patak has a physical way of controlling his actions. You want, you've chatted about that in here before, Mike, but I know that... Well, what's that? 
that, that card that you put on your screen. Oh yeah, no, that's the yeah. You have. To, I mean, I'm I'm from the country originally, and and intangible things or and and simple things kind of get the job done uh, and, and make the most sense. So. Uh, when I when I need to stop trading, I flip a, literally it's a trading card from the pits. Flip it over, and on the other side of it, uh, on my monitor, it's taped to my monitor. So in the morning, I flip it over, uh, so it's not covering my monitor. And then I, when I'm done trading for the day, if I consider it a day that I'm done, and that card flipped over, I'm done. And it's just make things very very simple. And that's one thing uh, that I like to push out is keep it as simple as possible. But going back to time spent analyzing, and time spent trading. When I got uh, my start, uh, uh, I was failing when I was just being, uh, when I just directly started trading. Uh, so I completely agree with what Mike Arnold's saying. Uh, the analyzing, getting to know yourself, getting to know the markets, getting to know all that, analyze as much as you can. I was blessed enough to then have the opportunity that I had a simulator uh, with a prop firm. They said if you could do kind of like our combine structure, if you can do this, we're going to back you, and if you can't do this, then you, you know, you get another shot, and you keep getting shots until basically you don't want to come to work anymore because you're not getting paid, and you got to come to work every day, and you're paying yourself to come to work. So uh, I, had, I had kind of the blessing of guys enough to be able to trade on a simulator and analyze myself all day long, and that's one thing that I'm a big you know pusher of is analyzing yourself over and over, self evaluations, reflect back on on how you're trading, where you want, and and if it's in line with where you want to go. Because uh, in this business and in any professional business, you're either you know you're either making progress or you're you're making excuses. So choose one of those and and, and do it to the best of your effort. And I hope it's making progress each and every day because uh, I believe that a lot of people can can be consistent and profitable at trading. Now, what level and and that you want to play the game at? That's something that you have to get to understand that. Uh, that's kind of where I'm at. You know, anything, every time I try to push a little bit harder than this and, and try to make uh, a lot more than this, uh, you know, I just, I, I'm not quite there. Of course, there, there's different hurdles to get over to, to keep excelling in your life and growing, but, you know, it's going to take more focus, it's going to take more discipline, it's going to take more hard work to keep rising above until you are Le, Le, uh, LeBron James and A-Rod of, of trading and all that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, that's what, uh, one thing I do kind of want to push out on that is 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 understanding the process and and staying with it. Real quick, I just want to go through a couple of these questions really fast because some of them I've let sit simply because they don't have to do with the subject we're talking about. So I want to make sure you guys know that I am reading the questions in here. Um, I've been told that traders who trade just the S and P mini will be the 90 percent is they don't have good game out there. What are your thoughts? We're not really doing strategy specific, Jason. I just didn't want to want you to think that I skipped your question. Um, thank you for that, Rob. Can you give some examples on trading fundamental topics and drills to practice and master these fundamentals? Again, the fundamentals really, we're not talking about market fundamentals. We're talking about your process, okay? And the things, if you don't have within your process, risk management, hard work, regular analysis, consistency in your process, consistency of risk and reward. That's really the whole thing that we're talking about yeah. here. Bob, I can talk about my fundamentals. What For me, I wanted to keep it simple, and it was everything that kind of people talk about. Cut your winners, let your, or cut your losers, let your winners ride. Like that. So for me, my fundamentals as a trader was making sure my uh, uh, win-loss ratio I had greater winners and losers. The time, my, uh, the time that I held my winners was longer than the time that I held my losers. And then I, I kind of bundled that up, and that's pretty simple. But if you want to go fundamentals, for me, that was just making sure I was doing little things like that. Besides understanding uh, my setups and what was coming, and, and that's analyzing things, I knew what I wanted to do and the basic fundamentals of getting it done. And in the end, and Bob, you've said this before, what type of trader uh, are you? Um, at that time, and, and still this day, I'm a high probability trader, and I, I would put that together and always keep the math on my side and, and tweak that up. So, you know, again, it goes back to what Bob said. You know, you have to understand what your process is, and, and you know, that's why it is like creating a business. Uh, it's wh what, are you, what are you working with? Um, where do you want to where do you want to be six months from now, a year from now? If it's a company, where do you want to be five years from now? Um, and and what are your what are you 
going to do to get there? What are you going to work on to get there? What are your objectives and all that kind of stuff? And, and having a plan and, and all that kind of stuff is definitely going to get you uh, at least a foundation where your mental capital, your confidence is going to grow with you. And, and at least it starts at the same same starting point rather than being so cocky and then going to the markets and having to fail. Now you can go with a plan and then stay the course. And Bob always says dance with the one that brung you. Stay sticking to your plan, discipline to your plan. So then uh, you know what to work on each and every day. Just like a batter uh, or just like a, a ball player would get up to the plate and, and swing what he's worked on consistently. And if it's if uh, he needs to work on certain things, he'll get with the batting coach and, and after uh, – uh, after the games are with, or look at film, or, or do whatever to tweak up certain aspects of their game. Theo says, "How is it with the best order types to be in the first in, first in the market?" Theo, you don't have to be first. I can count on one hand the amount of times I bought the low and sold the high. So don't worry so much about that. Um, Mark put in a really good quote from uh, Mark Douglas's "Trading in the Zone." I'm going to read it because it's really good. But if you haven't read, Mark Douglas is trading in the zone. You should. Full disclosure, I don't get paid if you go buy it. Um, let's see. Anything can happen. You don't need to know what is going to happen next in order to make money. There's a random distribution between wins and losses for any given set of variables that define an edge. An edge is nothing more than an indication of a higher probability of one thing happening over another. Every moment in the market is unique. So thanks for that, Mark. Appreciate that. Um, let's see, Kelly, you talk again about high frequency traders and how they have given you, what did you say, given the concept of slippage a whole new dimension. You know, we all play on the same playing field. Mm -hmm. So when the NBA players started averaging six and a half, seven feet, it was averaging that for everybody. Um, when they moved the goal poles back for field goals from the front of the end zone to the back, it affected everybody, right? When, dry, you know, Drivers and, and golf balls started becoming easier to hit far. It affected everybody. We're all working within that, and there still are successful traders. So I'd really like to convince you guys to stop focusing on high frequency if we can get anything done in this particular panel. But let's see, Mark. Pro traders take full responsibility and accountability for their results. Retail traders look for fault and excuses. It's more comments by Mark. They're good comments. What is the spelling of that trader in California? It's Rishi Narang. It's N-A-R-A-N-G. Rishi is R-I-S-H-I. -I. Uh, he wrote a, two books called uh, Inside the Black Box, which are pretty interesting, too. Uh, let's see what, what else we have in here that applies. Please give us the golf book again. That was uh, Zen Golf. Let's see. That is the number one reason to use TST. Oh, it's a compliment for TST. I can, I can read that. That is the number one reason to use TST. That's why I'm here. It feels real without the huge losses. The only way I can learn is real pressure, but I can't afford to lose 100 k like you guys. That's fine. Um, okay. Let's see here. We're going to start wrapping this up, but I want to make sure, again, I get down to questions that we haven't already answered. How do we stay disciplined day in and day out? I'll take that one, Bob. Yeah, feel free. <laughs> I know what that, I want to say, but it might know, that, I mean that that understand that that's what you signed up to do, and that's one thing that every athlete. And I'm guys. I'm going to go back to athletes all the time because it makes sense. I didn't start putting it together. I did a, a football in high school. I got uh, recruited to play football at Iowa State. I did it for a semester, and I was third string. But I understood I was high school good. I was not college good. I didn't. I couldn't justify playing ball in college because I was a part of the 90% unsuccessful. And it's, it's, I don't even know that's a statistic. But my whole point is I knew I wasn't college good. And then to play at the pro level, and but I also saw how much dedication these guys put into it. And then uh, knowing pro guys uh, here in Chicago and, and certain things like that, you understand how much effort and energy it takes consistently, day in and day out, day in and day out. But that's why you get paid the big bucks, uh, and, and and that's why you can make money at this business is by staying dedicated. Uh, think about this. How, how do you stay disciplined? How do you stay disciplined each day uh, brushing your teeth before you go to bed? You know, that's a discipline that you do. There's something in your life that you stay disciplined at that has a payoff. So understand that. 
there's there's a payoff to being disciplined. It is not instant because that's the gambler type of way that's impulsive. And instant gratification does not really work too too well with uh, staying disciplined. Uh, staying disciplined, it shows up down the road. It is delayed gratification. So staying to to the uh, the process that Bob was talking about, what I talked about, like you either making progress or excuses, sticking to the process and understand that this could take time. It could take a lot of time, and 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 I'm sorry, but there's nobody really tell you when that time is up or you start understanding it or not. Uh, it's a process. Some will get it, some will fall to the side, and some will excel at it to heights above and beyond their, their wildest dreams. So uh, the key to, to it is, is, is stay disciplined. Uh, find something that you are disciplined at, and, and why are you disciplined in that, uh, and, and go from there. But it's something that you signed up for every day, and, and the minute that you kind of lose focus on, on what it is, and you just throw that trade on, and it's the minute that, you know, you gave back your day, your week, your month, or your year, and, and then you throw your whole, you know, your whole professional contract out the window. And, and you don't want to do that. You want to, because there's a lot of talented individuals here, whether they're just a long snapper, or whether they're Adrian Petersons or LeBron James in here. Uh, retail traders, <coughs> uh, athletes, they all started, I mean, retail traders and, and professional traders, they all started at one point, what is a bid, what is an offer? Uh, you know, bull, bull market, bear market. We all started with, okay, what is that? Uh, just get over certain humps. Understand that it is a process, uh, and don't get discouraged. And keep, if it's something that you really are passionate about doing, stay the course. There's a lot more comments on here than questions, which is good. So I'm just going to kind of kind of whip through them. And Bob, I'll um, say. Bob, I'll say one last thing. And play yeah, small. Please. And my last analogy with this: play small ball with 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 making yourself a better trader. Work on little things consistently. Whether that's this month, I'm going to focus on having my winning trades greater than my losing trades, or I have a consistent fear of missing out. This this month, I'm going to let uh, those trades that you talked about, Bob, where 99% of it lines up with it, let it go and see what happens. You're going to dilute that power, that fear of missing out power. Certain things you need to focus on, but they have you can't do it all in one bite. You have to focus on little things at a time, improve, 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 and then you'll notice it down the road. It could be six months, eight months, a year down the road, but you will notice it. Try to keep yourself in, in, a, uh, in an environment that uh, you can feel the market, uh, yet you don't have a lot of money on the line. That is one thing that we, we developed the combine to do, but you can still do that on your own. If you don't want to be in the combine, you can still uh, have all your trades have all your trades go to your, your best friend or whatever, so they actually get to see how you trade and things like that. So there's different ways you can, you can do this to hold yourself accountable without being in the combine, but uh, holding yourself accountable and, and staying the course is going to, and, and chipping away, one little bad habit at a time or whatever is going to help you get better each and every day. Thanks, Mikey. I'm just going to rip through some of these comments and then add some things to some of these questions. If anyone wants to jump in, feel free. Um, how many trades does one take daily as a professional? You know, that varies dramatically strategy to strategy. Brian says no one can see beyond the right edge, and maybe that's the first thing a new trader has to learn to accept. You do not know what will happen when you click buy or sell. If you can't deal with that truth, go find another sport. I totally agree with you. Yeah, we got. Uh, we have. We have to learn to be uncomfortable. Be comfortable being uncomfortable in this business. So yeah, it's a great comment. What type of strategies does Top Step teach? Top Step Trader doesn't teach strategies. James College of Trader Development does, but we just don't. This is just not the proper forum for that. If you don't mind, um, let's see. Brian says the pressure will always be there. I agree, Brian. You learn to manage it. What about a trading plan? Very important. Go back and, and watch the many trading plan webinars that there are on Big Mike's uh, forum. There's a ton of them, and a lot of them are very, very good. Do you, do you code your strategy into auto trade for backtesting to see if you have a worthy setup? Some people do, Hugh. Um, I've been a manual backtester for a long time. You know what that does? That makes my strategies much more simple. Uh, Mike Arnold has a lot more experience with programming some of that stuff than I do. Let's see, what software do you use for the decision tree? Mike, Arnold, do you use software? Oh, I just build it. I use a program called SmartDraw just to build it. Uh, it's a simple, you can build in anything. You can build it in Excel just with the drawing tools in Excel. Just color code boxes and then have branches going off. 
and it's it's actually a really good tool because if you can just the, the decision tree if you can put your strategy in terms of a decision tree then it is repeatable that also takes a lot of pressure off you because it's sort of like a checklist as you're going through during the market you're doing your analysis and a lot of people how do I stay disciplined how do I say this well if you have a decision tree it's as simply as going through the steps and if you ever get a step that results in no trade then there is no trade if you get to the end when it says place trade then you can place the trade that's why I love putting my strategies in the form of decision trees because also then it's repeatable if I can't get a strategy into a decision tree then it's not repeatable and if it's not repeatable for me I can't trade it James is asking how much course costs again not a strict not a sales webinar so James just reach out to them if you're interested Discuss, please, how each of you have moved from initial levels of, levels of safe trading to where you improve your money management, increasing your position size and position management. Kelly, my position size is uh, from the time I started being successful, and I have Mike Patak B. He blew out three $30,000 accounts. I blew out one $97,000 account. But for me, it was all about um, percentage of capital, and then naturally, as I did better, my risk increased. Because my capital increased, therefore my percentage of capital at risk increased. Conversely, it decreased when I was losing, and that helped me slow down losing streaks. So that's what worked for me. Um, hey, Bob. Do you think someone can su – yeah, hey, go ahead. I'm sorry, this is Mike. Uh, I see there's actually a lot of questions here asking about the, the program at Top Step. So if you want to just take just one minute and just kind of answer – briefly so everybody knows and then everybody that has those questions uh, tell them how to email you or, or what to do that way we can kind of address it all at one time sure well you can see the email on the slide here it's tstu at topsteptrader.com the College of Trader Development has 75 lectures uh, pre-recorded lectures the shortest one I think is about 15 minutes the longest ones about an hour and it's basically soup to nuts it's basics all the way through to actual step-by-step -step strategy and then some live analysis thrown into some of the later recordings. We sort it by freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, and masters. Uh, you get a real cute diploma at the end of it. But the fact of the matter is Mike Arnold and I developed the course in conjunction with Mike Bertak at Top Step Trader to kind of take people back to the start, price action, uh, price patterns, all the way back to what is a bar and what is behind that particular bar, all the way through to strategies that Mike Arnold and I both that teach, develop, um, et cetera. We essentially decided that there needed to be a college of trading, not just a strategy factory. And that's exactly what this is. So again, I don't like to be salesy. Yeah, I don't like to read my bio. Go ahead, Mike. Well, no, I'll, I'll kind of speak for you, Bob. That's one of the reasons why you know we chose to partner with Bob and, and Mike with this, because we, as a trader, you, we want to have a professional sports model to remotely train, develop, and recruit traders from all over the world. And we use the sports analogy because it makes sense. And it brings people down to, all right, so I can get this done. Let's keep it basic. That's why they have the freshmen. They have, they have the sophomore levels. They have different levels. And you cannot excel past them unless you test out. We don't just, it's not just sending you, I've done online trading academy. There's nothing wrong with that. But I, I, I got uh, DVDs and it's $2,500 and stuff like that. And I, you know, I took them at my own speed. We, you don't excel past uh, class unless you test out of it. Prop firms down here in Chicago, you have to have 95% or better. I have buddies that uh, had gone through when they were trainees and, and now been at the prop firm for years. Uh, and uh, you have to have a 95% or better to, to keep, you know, moving on in their, their little training program. Uh, but they're bringing it, working with you and all that kind of stuff. So uh, it's a great combination. Um, and it's not for everybody. But uh, if trading is what you're looking to do and get better in, you know, it's a good opportunity. There's also uh, included in the college is two hours of live Q&A a week with myself and Mike Arnold. We call it office hours. This is kind of like if you went down to your professor's office and just sort of asked any question you wanted to ask about the subject matter. So um, hopefully I covered all the questions about it. You know, again, I, I don't really like to be salesy, so. Let's see what else we have in here. Make sure your expected profit is three times your anticipated risk. I don't have a problem with that, Charles. 
then again, that's very strategy specific. Do you think someone can succeed to learn day trading? The E-mini with a max 1 to 1.5 stop loss? Yeah, Rob, I do think it's possible. But again, that's a very strategy specific question. Let's see. What time frame charts do you use? They're assorted, Jeff. That's a good comment, Charles. For the batter, it's more about pitch selection than the swing. Combine pitch, pitch selection with a bad swing, though, Charles, and watch what happens. See, this is the thing we talk about. It's, it's consistency. I use a lot of food analogies, being a slightly stocky Italian guy. And to me, if you have the best recipe in the world for meatballs, but you don't follow it, it's worthless. And if you've got a bad recipe for meatballs, but you follow it correctly every single time, you can improve it. It's about consistency. Let's see. Since we're talking about Mark Douglas, would you say that developing into a professional trader is more of a mental analysis than a technical or market analysis? Uh, Sam, I think it's more about controlling the mental aspect of it. I'm actually going to throw that to Mike Arnold because of his neuro-linguistic programming. Uh, there's a huge, a huge mental component to that, but you have to have the proper structure to build it on. Again, if you don't have some kind of repeatable process in place, if you're just shooting from the hip, if you don't have uh, a proper structure and methodology from which to that could be successful in the market, then then you all the psycho psychology and all the mental aspect isn't going to really help you. Now, once you have a, a, a proper methodology and, and trading structure in place, and then you find yourself, you know, skipping trades, putting on trades that aren't part of your plan, uh, running your fear or greed patterns, modifying your trades midway through, you know, adjusting, you know, it's getting close to your stop, pulling your stop. Now, those are psychological things and mental things that a lot of traders go through and that's where the you know it's whatever the percentage is maybe it's you know seventy percent of, of traders have to struggle over to overcome those and it, I think it's a very large part of trading however you need to have that solid foundation in place you need to have the fundamentals you need to know how to dribble the ball how to with both hands how to do the layup how to set up a, a pick and roll you need to know those things and then if you're having problems during the game time and short circuiting, then that's where the mental and the psychology comes in. But if you don't know the basics, all the psychology in the world is not going to help you fix flawed fundamentals. So they go hand in hand. Proper fundamentals and then the proper trading psychology and the mental training to go with it go hand in hand. And lead you into a, a professional realm of being a trader. And it doesn't just end, especially the, the sort of psychology aspect. It's sort of like peeling, peeling back an onion. You know, a lot of traders, they take one step forward, they find something, they uncover another layer. But as they're doing that with the proper fundamentals, they keep progressing forward and forward. And then eventually, a lot for people who continue to work on it, you know, the light goes off and all of a sudden, they somewhat blossom into that professional realm. Let's see. Are there many traders you can think of that succeed without having a defined methodology to start? I'm going to answer that in two ways, Rob. Uh, the first answer is no. The second answer is I don't know many traders that still trade their first defined methodology. Does that make sense? You have to be consistent. You have to define as best you can what you're going to be doing in the market. What happens if it goes up? What happens if it goes down? What happens once I'm in a trade? Define it. The only time you're thinking clearly is before a trade, Rob. You're never thinking clearly when you're in one. The they only time you're thinking is before. Yeah, they used to say, I remember when I was in the pits, uh, when you put on a position that you couldn't, you weren't typically used to, they would always say, what's one plus one, like it, 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 your IQ goes to zero. Like literally your IQ goes to zero, especially when you take on more risk. And in the pits, you could take on, it's not like uh, electronic trading where you click and it, it gets rejected. If you say sold to it and you get slapped with a 300 lot, you know, and, and your IQ goes to zero. And <clears throat> that's something that uh, 
uh, yeah, you have to deal with. Yeah, I love that IQ going to zero. Could you guys speak a bit about managing daily loss limits and risk in general? Uh, before I read the rest of this question, Evander, uh, risk in general, I have a problem with that part of your question because risk is very, very specific to the person taking that risk. If there's any guidelines or general advice for better risk management, you know, again, don't take risk you can't stomach. I tell people all the time, a real simple rule, if you're nervous during your trade, you have too much risk. A real simple rule. Start with that one. Did you get a chance to show the early slide which was full of text? Oh, I think I did that for you already, Kelly, right? I think it was, yeah, I think we did that already. If some fail in the combine, let me actually, somebody rewrote the ninja question. Mike, do you want to address that? Will Top Step Trader have Ninja soon? Hey, throw that out there now. hey Bob. Uh, yeah, we'll have Ninja. Be Sorry, and Mike, before you do that, uh, I, I kind of wanted to chime in real quick on the risk thing, if you don't, if you guys don't mind, because I see this, but kind of like the in the clouds view, looking down on the forum and seeing all these guys, all these journals, and I can see a lot of consistent behavior sometimes or patterns. And one thing that I see, and I it really, it it bothers me, so I. I want to talk about it for a second, is I see everybody taking risks that really they weren't prepared to take. They're trading too big, too big a size. And what I see them do to try to correct that behavior is they start changing their time frame on the charts to smaller and smaller and smaller charts because they equate that with, with less risk. And then there's like a point of diminishing returns where now they're trading such a small chart, such a small time frame that they're getting chopped around and they're over trading and they're taking too many trades and they're trading noise. And it's just like, they, when they're, when, I mean, I've done this, I'm speaking from experience and now I can see it really easily when I see other people making what I would view as these mistakes. Uh, it's really hard when you're in the trenches to know that's what is happening. You can't, you can't really, it's like you have blinders on, you can't really tell that's what's happening. So I would encourage anybody that that's, this is kind of resonating with to you know step back for just a moment and you got to risk is the most important thing I think of anything to do in trading and Bob touched on it for just one second he said something about being comfortable in a trade and frankly that is what it's really all about because if you trade a, a size that you're not comfortable with and Mike said this too your IQ goes to zero in other words you, you can't think clearly you're not making good decisions you're gonna make stupid decisions and uh, it's it's really the most important thing I could possibly resonate with anybody is to is trade smaller. That's what it takes for you to put on a trade without having to, you know, second guess or panic or get scared or, you know, make bad decisions. Just trade smaller, you know, and, and, and I'll say one last thing and then I'll give it back to you guys. I see a lot of people that are unwilling, like, like I can almost hear the people right now saying, I, I don't want to trade smaller because then I can't make my losses back. And it's really, it's really difficult because, again, I'm speaking from experience, guys. I know this stuff, and I see this stuff on the forum, too. And you've got to get through it. And one way to get through it is to recognize that if you want to be a good trader, you've got to stop thinking about making losses back or something like that, whether it's for the day, the week, the month, the year, or your entire trading career. You got to instead just focus on trading well, one trade at a time. So don't use that as an excuse. Trade whatever size you need to trade to make it comfortable, and then build on that. All right. Sorry for the yep. lecture. Well, I can think. Uh, I can. I want to add to that. I think every trader uh, goes through the phase too, where they because I think majority of traders have losses in the beginning, and they always said. I remember learning. They said the worst is when you make money in the beginning, because then you fight the losses when they happen. Yeah, uh, absolutely. But. Uh, you know, I went through the phase too where I, wa I wanted to make up everything I lost and I wanted to make it up quick so that I could start all that. It took me, uh, after I, uh, and it took me actually blowing out of all my accounts, really not having any money to fund a new account, then go to a prop firm that says, all right, you're going to trade one lots and you're going to have a $300 a day loss limit. I was like, what? And they're like, you want the opportunity? Or, or you know, the opportunity is here, take it or leave it. And I'm like, okay. So now I'm trading one lots when before I was having $5,000 swings up and down and, and I thought that's how trading was. Um, once I started doing that, I understand that it was a brick by brick type of game where it's slow and steady. It's, it's, we've all heard the line, it's a marathon, it's not a race, uh, all that kind of stuff. And, and I did, I mean, I had on a little piece of paper that, okay, I started with the cheapest thing, you know, my e-signal or, or whatever, you know, all this little losses that I've had, education that I've had, 
and then I'm like, okay, once I kind of go through X amount of time, I can eventually have this all paid off. And I had it like, it wasn't anything that was, when I started the day, that's what I had to do, but it was like my objective, like, you know, okay, I made 10000 this month, uh, you know, I basically paid off this, this, and this for my past. Right. And it psychologically got me more confident. It helped build my mental capital at that time, but it was definitely not a list I stuck, or stuck right in front and said, I need to make this today to, 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 to uh, make it all back, and, and then I'm okay. Right. Man, you, you just said something that reminded me, and uh, sorry for going off the rails here, but uh, one other thing about risk, and again, I'm speaking from experience looking at everybody on the forum. One thing I see all the time is people will go into Excel and they'll create all these fantastic spreadsheets about how much money they're going to make. It's all about, oh, man, I'm going to go from one contract to two, and then when this happens, I'm going to go to four, and then when this happens, I'm going to go to ten, and, you know, by the end of the year, I'm going to be Bill Gates. You know, and that, no one ever makes a spreadsheet that talks about risk. Guys, please, 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 risk. Risk is where it's at. Yep. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mike and Mike, and it's, it's interesting, I don't want to continue because they said pretty much everything I would have said, but you, ha you absolutely have to think that way, and it's counterintuitive. All right, Mary threw something in here that I want to touch on. Today I did not have a setup on the market I trade. I find it really hard to explain to my husband that I didn't do anything today. Any advice as to how to explain to a spouse why sometimes there are no trade days? I want to relate trading again to a regular job, okay? Um, Let's relate it to, I don't know, I'm trying to stay away from food, but I have a difficult time doing that. Let's relate it to Mike Patak's landscaping business, right? He went into the office, he fielded calls, he did book work, but he didn't have a landscaping job that day. He still went to work. It's really easy in a regular job because if you just break it down to hourly, you know if you go to work from 9 to 5, at the end of the 5 days you're going to bring home X amount of money. You know if you take an unpaid day off that that's going to reduce your money. Trading is the same thing. Mary, you studied your charts and didn't find a setup. You actually did do something. Okay, you controlled yourself. You didn't lose money. Well, Bob, okay. we, say all, we say all the time, being a trader is also not trading. You know, it's knowing when to not trade. Huge, huge part of it. Huge part of it. Okay, your job as a trader is to analyze the markets and make correct decisions. It's not to take trades. Some of your analysis ends up giving you trades, okay? Some of it ends up not giving you trades. This is the way it works, right? Again, I just, I don't know, Big Mike. I mean, I got a compliment in here, but I don't want to read it. I feel funny. Let me keep going through these. Let's see. Oh, uh, man, feel free. Uh, feel free. You can read it. Some in the combine after all. Six, uh, I just hate Actually, let me give Mike Pataki option to answer that ninja trade, ninja trader question. Uh, yeah, we are a Ninja Trader, and guys, this has been as frustrating for me as as it has, and I've, I've uh, on the Big Mike's forum all the time, and uh, following the thread that we have, and I get questions about Ninja all the time. Uh, building this environment out and, and and everything we have has been a bigger process than I ever thought it could be, uh, but uh, we will have something by the end of the year for you guys. Uh, this is something that uh, I feel really confident about, and uh, what we're working on right now is really exciting and we're getting closer. So that's what I got for you guys right now, but uh, we got a lot of incredible stuff with Top Step Trader coming out. We have a whole new website being launched in a week, uh, actually within two weeks, and uh, some crazy stuff coming out. So uh, needless to say, Ninja is right there, and it should be there before 2014. Thanks, Mike. Uh Naj Mule, I'm not sure what you mean by your question. I just want you to know I read it. Sharon asked a question about tax implications with IRAs. Uh, you say that you never hear any traders talk about this. Uh, Big Mike, you might want to have a, a trading tax attorney do a webinar one of these days. I'm certainly not going to take on a tax question. Um, let's see. How do you learn to visualize all the possible outcomes for a trade to follow? You, Rob, you can only visualize the outcomes that fit within your setups. Okay, the fact of the matter, the market either moves up or down. That's it. Those are the outcomes. Now, you also threw in here, don't you have to know it's what the market's going to To manage a position, you have to understand how price action is unfolding. No. Again, believe it or not, that's a strategy-specific question. I only want you guys managing winners. I don't want you guys managing losers because you'll make bad decisions. You know where I manage my, my losers? Before the trade's on. What is going to cause me to get out of this trade? What price level? That's how I do it. 
You have to find the way you do it. You won't make good decisions when you're in the trade. Let's see. To me, it seems the combine favors higher batting average systems over lowing, lower batting average systems, even if that lower batting average system has a higher expectancy and overall profitability. This is because of the psychological demands required on a trader to follow such systems. Um, I can tell you how I'd answer that from being a, in a joint venture with these guys. For me, the, the equity partner chooses the type of partners they want to fund. Uh, no, Jib, and that's their right to do that. Um, having said that, keep your ears open for something in the future that might fit you. But, you know, you guys got to understand that when you have an equity partner funding people, they can really fund whoever they want. So they give you their rules, and, and hopefully you fit within those rules. And if you don't, Top Step Trade is still a great place to learn uh, we, and to sort of get discipline built into you. Bob, I want to throw out there, you can customize. We have a lot of people that, that strip down all that and, and customize their combine with uh, something that fits within their uh, trading plan, uh, their methodology, and, and all that kind of good stuff. So there is our basic combine, and there's a way you can customize, and, and you can call and talk to somebody, and they can, uh, if it's something a little bit outside the realm, we have to get that approved from the equity partner. And they kind of run that through kind of a risk thing, and 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 if it gets okayed, then you get the phone call back saying, "Hey, your strategy and your trading plan got approved in this combine to get reviewed, and and it's your choice to move forward with us or not." Let's see. How long does CTD take to complete? Um, James, again, why don't you reach out at Top Step at the email that you see on your screen? It can be finished within, I think, four to six weeks at the earliest. But isn't it more important that you learn the material than you finish it quickly? I mean, I'm not saying that that's what you're saying, but you know, I understand the question about how much it costs. But for me, if I decided that something was valuable to get me where I wanted to go, two weeks, two months, two years, I'm still going to look into it. What are your thoughts on order waiting trade versus waiting for the tape to confirm and aggressively entering the trade? Uh, Jason, everyone has to make trading their own. If you're a tape reader, I have nothing against it. I don't use it. If it works for you and you're good at it, we know some good tape readers. Um, I know that to a certain degree, Mike Arnold uses some of it, entering already triggered trades on another method he uses. But other than that, you know, if it works for you, I have no issue with it. Again, like Big Mike said and like Mike Ritak followed up on, for us, it's more about your risk. A lot of the other stuff you can adjust to fit your personality. How to discipline disappointment when you're losing? How do you stay disciplined when you're losing? Well, again, that's just kind of the point. If you have researched your strategy and you're consistent, it's a heck of a lot easier. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, I wrote down this before because I always told myself, you pay when you make a mistake. That's you get. That's basically your your learning, and it's the cost of learning in this business. So. So we got to learn from our bad trades, and you got to quickly move on. And when I say learn, actually learn. Journal it, take it down, absorb it, because if you learn from it, then the next time something like that happens or that situation might appear, if you learn from it, you'll avoid it. You're going to create this discipline path of always learning from things and quickly moving on. This learning and moving on, it'll help you develop discipline, discipline and staying focused on producing and moving yourself down the field consistently. So. Uh, for me, you know, it was journaling consistently. If I screwed up during the day or if I was in a trade, I'd have this stream of consciousness go on where I'm in a trade, I would just start writing. If I had this uh, little emotion pop up of fear, I'd write, I started feeling scared for some reason. And then I would just write that down. And then it, it, it dilutes a lot of things. It puts your thoughts, instead of swirling around in your head when you got a trade on and you're up and down and, and you gave away your day or... or You've been in the hole all day. It gets things out on paper. You read that at the end of the day. You go through it. You put the time into it, and, and you learn that day. So at the end of the day, your tank is full of at least knowledge of what you did because everything you did in the market are things that you can learn from and, and then roll that into tomorrow and snowball it. I mean, every day you're adding more and more of what you're learning. Accelerate your, your learning curve. And, and get yourself in a position where you're staying disciplined, you're staying committed to the truth of what you're really doing, and, and you're moving yourself forward. For me, that was really effective. I have my journals. Actually, they're, they're worth nothing as far as uh, 50 cents or whatever, buying them from Walgreens or wherever I bought them from. They're little ones that I can put in my pocket. Uh, they're in my safe at home. 
and they're really valuable to me. And every now and then, I'll go through and read them because those are that's my business school. That was my PhD and, and, and all that kind of stuff. Is is all those losses that I took that I actually learned something from. I'm going to go ahead and read this. This is from Zumanon, who actually is one of the first College of Trader Development students, and he's a graduate now. This is not a question. Just a first thank you to CTD and to TST, College of Trader Development and Top Step Trader. I, I was in a constant and persistent losing behavior until I started with the College of Trader Development and graduated from it. I was looking for a good training program and could not find any that was well organized and made sense to me. Understanding money and risk management has helped me get my first rollover after more than 15 unsuccessful combines. I'm trading now with less stress and my confidence has increased. Good work. That's all I can say. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. The rest is coming. Thank you, Zumanon. I appreciate that. Zumanon is a very, very hard worker, so hats off to you. Bob, I know you work with him all the time, but uh, uh, the hard work and, and staying focused is just key for, for you know, the direction, and, and working with the right people also helps as well. All right, Kelly, write this down. Smart Draw is the program Mike to use, but you can use a pen and paper. It doesn't really matter. All right, Smart Draw is the one that he uses. Hugh, and this is our last question. Hugh said, do you ever just sit, say hell with it and sit on your hand for weeks until the market makes sense? Um, Hugh, the only thing that keeps me out for a week is my monthly loss limit, my drawdown. Um, other than that, I do my analysis every day. If I have trades, I take them. If I don't, I don't. It's just that simple. I don't try and have the market make sense. I just try and find my setups. That's it. Again, you know, this, there's this whole attachment to being right. Guys, last thing I'm going to say, and then I'll give Mike the talk the last word, and we can end this. I, um, I don't care about being right. It's not about being right. It's about putting on high probability trades. It's about doing analysis, and when those high probability trades show themselves, okay, you put those trades on with a risk you can stomach. Okay, and if I do that, I'm right whether the trade was profitable, break even, or a loss. Okay? Let me uh, throw it to Mike Arnold, and then I'll throw it to Mike Patak. Go ahead, Mike Arnold. Yeah, I've had that conversation with a lot of traders. And I asked them a question, would you rather be right or make money? I mean, a lot of traders, they're, they're two different things. They want to be right. And being right, they're, they're like, oh, I, I knew that trade was going there. I knew this was going to happen. I knew this was going to happen. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. You either had a valid setup, and even if you have a valid setup, you still don't know the outcome of the trade. Trading is not about being right. It's following your plan and your strategy and your methodology and doing consistently over and over again. And doing that, if it's a well-researched and well-formulated methodology that has you know, a positive trade expectancy, you will naturally make money. You should focus on following what you are doing, following your steps, putting on the trades, the valid trades, when there's no valid trade, sitting on your hands. That's what your focus should be, and the money will come. It's not about being right. We never know. I never know when I'm going to put on a trade if it's going to be a winner or a loser. If, it, if I did know beforehand, then naturally I'd skip all the losing trades and never have a losing trade. That does not happen. We all have losing trades. It's part of trading. You have to accept that part of trading. And if you can't, then you have to look at yourself as a trader and really question, is that the right thing for you? Because once you've decided to be a trader, especially taking it to the next level of professional trading, a professional trader, loss is a part of your life. You're going to have losing trades. There is no system or methodology that will get you 100% winning trades, nor should you bother looking for it. The shorter path is going to be to look really at yourself, find something consistently, and then work on your internal psychology and methodology so you can focus and execute it reliably and consistently following your steps. And I know that it, it, it sounds simple, and it's, for a lot of people it's not that simple, but if you can at least get that through and start focusing as that needs to be my mindset, not knowing which is going to be a winner, not knowing which is going to be a loser, not worrying about what the HFT firms are doing, not worrying about what your trading 
other people trading are doing. Focus on yourself. You're playing against the course. You're trading against the market. You're not trading against anybody else. It's actually a great point and well put. You ever, have, you ever been on like a car trip, maybe with a family or friends or something, you got that one annoying friend? I'll bet you the next car that comes down the street is yellow. Or I'll bet you the next car that comes down the street is red. Next one comes down the street, it's red. They go, I knew it. You didn't know it. Okay? You really didn't know it. All right? And it's the same way in trading. Mr. Patak, uh, you have a last word, sir. You know, I'm just going to end it with this. You know, you're, in trading, you're either making progress or you're making excuses. Think like a professional. Be a professional. You will get to the professional level. It may not be the biggest level that 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 you you dreamt up when you first started trading, but it will be a realistic, attainable level that you can produce on. It's an amazing, amazing business when you get over this hump of uh, uh, of it just eats you alive from the inside out. So my thing is always make progress. Train, develop, focus on. Uh, I, I always use like an athlete, a professional athlete, somebody I, I really liked. And I, instead of just watching them on the field, watch how they talk about how much they train. Uh, read about uh, the the extra work they do in the off season, all this kind of stuff. The stuff you never see, you know, that's how professional. Uh, that's all the. Then that's them clocking in. Uh, I believe there's every there's a professional in all of us. At, at what level that is, you know, that's for you to figure out. But. Uh, you know, make progress. Don't make excuses. Uh, this is something that isn't for everybody. Trading is not for everybody. But if uh, uh, those ones that are committed to it uh, and stay the course, there's a, there's. So <clears throat> that's all I got to say about that. Is make make sure you're making progress and you're not making excuses each day. Hey guys, hey, uh, Michael. If I could, I'm going to give Chad. Uh, I'm going to give Chad the last word, if you don't mind. Chad wrote, uh, "The only way to know if your plan is consistently profitable is to consistently work your process." And consistently, consistently execute your plan day in and day out. Yeah. Thanks for that, Chad. Big Good advice. advice. Thank you again. So, Good guys, uh, yeah. So, before we go, I want to ask uh, everybody. I just put a link in the room. So, there's a couple hundred people uh, in the webinar today. Uh, click that link and post your feedback about the webinar. I would appreciate that into the thread. And I want to thank uh, Top Step Trader. I want to thank Bob, Mike Arnold, Mike Patak for being here today. Sorry, John couldn't make it, but we'll do this again. I think it's informative, and uh, hopefully everybody will agree with me. So share your feedback in the thread. Guys, I'll post the recording on the YouTube channel sometime tomorrow. Thanks, guys. Have a good one. Sounds week. good. Appreciate it. Thank you.